there's a, like a little policeman there stopping us from getting in the lifts. Only certain, is that right? Uh, not usually a policeman. Oh, but well, you're right about uh, normal people. It's only abnormal people. <laughs> 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 Uh, welcome to a very, very special event. My name is Pete Miller. Uh, I have the honour of being uh, your Master of Ceremonies for today. Short, succinct book launch, very, very important uh, book launch. Uh, you've probably already seen the cover, but uh, we hope today this will be a line in the sand uh, for uh, the New South Wales health system and change in the New South Wales health system. I actually was a nurse at one stage of my life. Um, it was a long time ago, so I'm speaking from a little bit of experience. But mostly my job today is to introduce some uh, people who have been involved in the creation of this book and its story. Um, first off, I'm just going to ask you to uh, please my welcome the author of this, uh, uh, of this story here, uh, Therese. For her, and also keep her applause going for her two daughters here as well. Uh, yeah, we have some um, uh, politicians who have been a fantastic help to uh, what is really a, a tragic story, but we're hoping today um, is the start of, of change. And uh, also, also a fellow author of a, of a similar story, and also someone uh, who is from the medical action, uh, me medical era. Action Group, and uh, she has a fascinating story to tell. So let's start off with Andrew Stoner. Uh, he said that he's got a number of different uh, labels, and he forgets some of them, and there's so many of them here. There's the Shadow Minister for Roads, uh, Shadow Minister for State and Regional Development, the Shadow Minister for Ports and, and, uh, and Waterways. There's a, there's a lot there. But uh, most of all, he's the member for Oxley, which is uh, Theresa's husband's uh, the, yeah, local area up there in uh, Port Macquarie, and the leader of the Nationals in New South Wales since 2003. He has been a fantastic help to, uh, to uh, Theresa and her family, um, organising petitions, asking questions in Parliament, and um, we're welcome here today. Please put your hands together for Andrew Stone. Thank you, thank you, Pete, uh, uh, to um, Therese and uh, your girls, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm thrilled to be here on this special day. Um, look, I've known Therese and uh, formerly her husband, Don, uh, for a number of years. Uh, they've been passionate um, local advocates um, about issues of importance to the people of the Hastings. Um, but, uh, a little while ago, I got to know Therese even better, and uh, and that followed the uh, the tragic uh, death of her husband Don. Um, since then, I've come to appreciate um, Therese as a woman who is extremely courageous, um, who is also tenacious, um, and who I think uh, uh, is highly principled as well as determined. I've seen her take on uh, the bureaucracy. I've seen her take on the might of the New South Wales government. I've seen her stand out on the street with petitions in the heat for hours and hours on end in an effort to have the truth told regarding the circumstances of Don's tragic passing. <laughs> and at every step of the way, uh, the government has done their best uh, to have this story not told. But Therese, being as she is, courageous and tenacious and principled and determined, has made sure that the story is told. And in this book, the story, it's a, it's a compelling read. It's a love story. It's a story of passion and emotion, of a family affected by tragedy. But most importantly, it's a story that tells the truth. It's a story that needs to be told about uh, medical error, about the consequences of that. Because unless the story is told, there will be other victims of the system and the system will not improve. And that's why Therese and her friends and her family have pushed so hard and given so much of themselves through what must have been a most difficult period of time. So, Theresa, uh, can I congratulate you uh, on this outstanding book. If you haven't got one, get one, read it. It'll make you laugh, it'll make you cry, 
It'll make you wonder why. Thank you. Member Frostley, Andrew Stoner, thank you very, very much for that. Um, it is a story of courage, it's definitely true. Um, so we'll, we'll hear more about that uh, from Therese. Now, my wife's called Therese, I call her Teresa, Teresa, I've got a number of different um, names for her, so you're about the same, as you did a number of different spellings, so I'm, uh, I apologise if I call you Teresa, but it's, I, mix, I get my own wife mixed up, so that's all right. Um, uh, now, along with Therese has been her children, have there been a great support uh, to her, and so we're going to hear from uh, firstly Melissa, and then Alison, and then Therese. So please make uh, Melissa very, very welcome to this microphone. Hello, thank you everyone for coming. For me, it's hard to be angry and frustrated to a faceless thing. And by that, I mean, it's not one person that did this, but many. And I guess it's called the system. And in this, I am including the good doctors and nurses because there comes a time when silence becomes an accomplice to injustice. I'm so very proud of Mum for the strength it took to write this book. Her and Dad, have, sorry, her and Dad both have that ethic. You just get in and do it because it's the right thing to do and a matter like this cannot rest. By Mum writing this book and putting it out there is like a small victory for Dad. For me, seeing Dad treated the way he was, a man so strong, so independent and so outspoken, it frightens me. To think that no matter who you are, these things can happen to you. Your life can be changed, damaged or snatched from you in an instant. The memories of his last weeks in hospital haunt me forever. His last words to me were, help me. This will be with me forever. I failed him in this and I have to live with this. It was a cruel end to a beautiful life and I hope no one ever has to face this in their lifetime. It's time for things to change and I hope this book will open your eyes and make you aware the things on the surface aren't what they seem. I thank you very much. <laughs> So you definitely haven't failed. You definitely have not failed. That's um, that took a lot of courage, and you've obviously got that courage from uh, fr from your mother. There, well done, well done. But don't ever think you failed. That's that's wrong. Um, you're doing a terrific job, and um, we thank you for being here today and making that speech. Okay, let's hear from Alison <laughs> to make her feel welcome to this microphone. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Donald Mackay's youngest daughter <laughs> and what a pleasure it was to be so. My dad was an incredible man. I always admired him for his strength, his wit and humour and most importantly his willingness to help others. He was an amazing father, very involved in everything we were doing. We used to call him Big Ears and Jest because he never missed a trick. <laughs> it would take pages to describe who he was. His character was so rich. His presence was that of knowledge, power, and that he could get things done, no matter what. His humour always, and even now, brings a smile to my face and a chuckle. He had a face that he could do some hilarious face pulling with, a voice that could take on any accent or gender. He was never embarrassed to be silly with us as kids, and we thought he was so wonderful for making life fun and light-hearted for us. He was always the father, and we knew not to cross him, which was good, we needed that. <laughs> as I grew up and matured, I realised just how much he had been through and how devastating it would have been for him. I was only four when he had his accident and became a quadriplegic, so it was all I knew him to be and he never complained, not once. Dad hated that hospital. He had been there many times and each time the care worsened. I actually remember the second last time he went in there for a procedure. He said to me, if I come back here again I will die. I was in my early twenties then and he took it, and took it as a reflection of his dislike for the place. Sadly though, he was right. <laughs> the book Without Due Care describes what happened to him at the hospital the last time he was there. The treatment he received was horrific, undignified and cruel. We are all haunted by what happened to, happened to our lovely Donnie in that place. We tried so very hard to stand up for him in there, to find out what was going on. You cannot imagine the lies they told and the cold detachment of most that worked there. There was never just one person managing his case. There was no one who could answer for what had been done to him or what was happening to him. They lied to us by not telling us the real outcome of the procedure they performed called a pleurodesis. They led us to believe that there was no hope, uh, sorry, they led us to believe that there was hope and that they were looking for answers. This was an abuse of our trust. 
No one wants to believe that someone they love is not going to make it. But it is better to know than to keep someone alive with false hope. Dad knew himself that he wasn't going to make it. It is in the notes that he wouldn't survive this procedure. Why didn't they tell us? Why did they keep him alive on the ventilator? He suffered in those five and a half weeks from poor treatment, massive infection, cruelty and helplessness. They knew he would not recover. My mother Therese went through all the right channels to get justice for what was done to Dad in hospital. So that, so that it wouldn't happen to another. So that what happened to Dad could be a lesson to them to change the way they run the place. She was met by a system that was not designed to help people, but designed to protect the doctors, nurses and hospital. I am so very proud of Mum for publishing this book. People need to know what is going on, out, what is going on inside of our hospitals. And Dad's story needs to be told. He can have some justice now for what he endured in that horrible place. When I go to think of Dad, I have all of these wonderful memories of the times we shared. But there is always the image of him in that hospital. It is not how he deserved to live the last bit of time on his... Oh, sorry. It is not how he deserved to live his last bit of time on this planet. He deserved to be able to have control and they took his voice away and proceeded to treat him as if he was not even human. The thing about all of what happened to Dad in there that gets me is, he ne is that he suffered so much in his life already by being a quadriplegic and never complained. So how could they do this to him? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I love your speech, thank you. I love your tribute as well. Um, sorry about the, the, the noise, ladies and gentlemen. It's amazing. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. He's got to go. Okay, now to someone the reason why we're all here today, um, she's been described as courageous, but an author, and uh, you probably never set out to be an author, but felt a, a very, very strong need for, for this to be said. Um, I want you please to be upstanding and make for welcome the author of, uh, of this book here today, like please. To Teresa yeah. Mignot, give her a good round of applause. I don't feel very courageous, I've got to be honest, but maybe you can only be courageous if you're scared to. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to, I feel like I'm among friends here because a lot of the people here are my friends and my family, so I shouldn't be that way. I'd like to thank uh, Mr Andrew Stoner for the support that he's given us over the last three years. Um, his, uh, his invaluable help in holding my book launch here in the Parliament House, which wouldn't have happened without his help. Also. Um, Getting uh, what happened to Don outside the Hastings Valley, it's very hard when you're in the country to get the Sydney media interested in what happens in the country, so there's a lot of things happening in the country that people down here in the city never come across. It's only right that this book is launched here under this very roof, this uh, place where the lack of accountability, cost-cutting and enabling of a top-heavy administration has been allowed to flourish for the last 15 years under Labor, actions which have caused the running down of the public health system in New South Wales. I would like to thank John Hatton, who has come from the South Coast to be here and support this book launch. My husband, Don and John, got to know each other back in the early 1990s, and Don developed a great respect for John Hatton. Thanks also to Eve Hillary, author of Sarah's Last Wish, which is a, a book similar, similar on a similar issue, but different again. And Lorraine Long, who heads the Medical Error Action Group uh, and has some res quite some responsibility for um, Dr. Graham Roos being on trial right now, uh, the Vega doctor. Um, there's a lot of people to thank and you're all here, not to take me too long to go through all the names really. Um, Kurumbong Printing, John Duffy, went above and beyond the call of duty, bringing my pallet load of books from Kurumbong up to Port Macquarie after work one night and back that same night, so, and that was, that was amazing. You're all here, Dorothy Johnson, I, I, Sue, my sisters, Joan, and, and if I've missed somebody, Carmel, I probably have, don't be insulted. Writing this book has been the very hardest thing I've ever done in my life and never hoped to do. Many tears were shed in the writing. There were times when I thought of giving up, but I was so haunted by what a witness happened to Don that after a few days I would have to get back to work. I had no choice in this, it was just the right thing to do. Don suffered unbelievable pain and indignity over the past 25 years, but it was nothing compared to the horror that was unleashed on him in this hospital. Because we love him on us too, I don't think I will ever fully recover from what I know and what I saw in those last five weeks. What Don had to go through before his death still makes me feel physically ill at times. And the pictures play over and over in my mind. 
especially at night time. Um, I haven't got my book here, but that's okay. I just wanted to, you've all seen it. This book, and that's, that's one of my favourite photos of Don actually. Um, he loved having his photo taken and he loved to be in the company of women as my <laughs> sisters know. <laughs> Photographed with many women. <laughs> this book is my way of freeing myself and our family and thus freeing Don. I am hoping to get justice for Don. It was all preventable and arose from ignorance, arrogance and a fundamental lack of care. It eases with time, but without warning we can be thrown back into it. My husband and my husband Don, father of Melissa and Alison, died because of what was done to him in a major Sydney teaching hospital, a wrong and totally unnecessary operation. A lung a mistakenly suctioned for 22 hours at 10 times the correct rate, which we were never told about, although they knew after the first three days. A severe MRSA, golden staph, infection inside his lungs, which occurred, we think, after a nurse picked up a suction tube that fell on the floor and put it in his mouth in front of us. Oops. Um, and then when we, we called her out, she just she was just bold and she said, well, what can I do about it, basically? Four or five days later, he had MRSA in his lungs and what they call the drowning pneumonia, which you catch in hospital, called Klebsiella pneumonia. This, over the five-week period, went into sepsis right through his body. Um, he was grossly edematous, um, like his whole body was full of fluid. None of this should have happened. The hundreds of errors and numerous instances of lack of caring listed in the book are only those I witnessed or discovered during the 12 hours I was there with Don each day for the five nightmarish weeks. Common sense tells me many more would have occurred, but um, I think for my own sanity it's good that I don't know what happened. Knowing the grievous impact on Don of the errors they had made, senior doctors in that hospital effectively imposed a blanket ban on any information getting to us about every aspect of Don's condition, its causes, its treatment, alternative options, possible